All right, good morning, folks. So uh, today, we're going to talk about methods, uh, and spe uh, specifically some of the, the nice uses of methods. We did a little bit last time with sort of you know, methods with, with no parameters and stuff. Those, those are useful in a lot of contexts, but I want to give you some more examples and uh, sort of go through sort of step by step the process that uh, happens when you run a program that actually contains uh, methods in it. Then as sort of an extension to that and something that is important, not just for methods, but also for things like uh, if statements and loops, stuff that we've talked about before, uh, we're going to talk about scope as well. So it's sort of a sort of a two part thing uh, today. So remember that methods are essentially uh, mini programs. They take some input, they do something with that input, and then they give you some output back, just like our full programs did. So for the homeworks, for the labs, your program would take some input, do some work, and then give you an output. Usually the input's coming from the keyboard, and the output is going to the console, so, so, so to the screen, so you can see what it looks like. But a method is just meant to be a smaller sort of piece of a program inside of something larger. So we're going to look at uh, sort of large, some larger methods and then uh, a reason why you would want to use uh, methods uh, overall. Uh, can, 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 folks, can folks hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. All right. So uh, methods can take any number of parameters. These member parameters are what you expect the inputs to be. So you, if you expect the inputs to be, say, you need, you need two integers to do some amount of work, then the parameters would be two integers. You do have to give them a type. You do have to say, are they ints? Are they doubles? Are they strings? Those are dealt with in the signature. And we looked a little bit at method signatures last time. We're going to take a closer look at uh, some different method signatures today. Uh, when you call a method, so that's some of the terminology here, calling a method, you're passing values into the method. You're giving the method the input that it needs. Just like when you run, a, run sort of the programs we've been writing so far, we type in values for our program. When you call a method, you're passing in values to that method. So some of the terminology you're going to hear for you know, you know, today and the rest of the semester and the rest of this sort of any coding you do is calling a method or calling a function. And what values are you passing into that function or passing into that method? So we're not going to specifically code this one up, but this is an example of something that potentially you could do. Potentially you could write a simple method, get some user input, send the input into the method, and then get a result. So I'm going to sort of draw how this, this, this functions. And there's nothing here that uh, that you haven't really seen before other than potentially some of the method stuff. So uh, with the little sort of drawing tool here, uh, the first piece of this, the first little bits of this here, is just the scanner and creating some variables, asking the user to enter two numbers, and then calling next double twice. So you get input one and input two. So those are going to come from the keyboard. Those will come from the actual the user themselves. And that's, this isn't any different than the homeworks we've been working on in the labs and, and your previous examples. The difference comes in the line, I guess yellow's not great for that. The difference comes in the line that's here. So this has a method call. And it's a method that we specifically wrote. That's why it's down here. Remember, we need public static. We need the type. So what this returns, the value, the type of value that it gives us back, the name, and as many parameters as we want. So this whole first line is the signature, public static double, do calculation, double A, double B. That's the signature. That's where you define what does this method do? What does it need? What's its name? And what does it give you back? The calculation itself can really be anything. In this case, it's going to take A and B, and it's going to do a calculation, and it's going to return whatever the result of that calculation is. Uh, 
So in most methods, not, not all methods, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, sort of some that, that don't have a return statement in the future, but in most methods, you're going to have some kind of return statement. So you're going to return something. As long as there's a type here that's anything other than void. So notice for main, main is just a method, and it says void here. This one says double, so we need to return a double. So what happens when you run this? Is it's going to take, let me change the color here. It's going to take input one, and it's going to send it to right here. And we're going to take input two, and we're going to put that value right here. So whatever the user typed in, those are the numbers that are going to be filled in in the actual method call. Then the method actually runs. And what happens, and then I have a few pop-ups here that sort of show that as well. So we talked about the double return type and the double parameters. What happens is this. The value that is in the first spot here in my method call gets copied into A. And the value in the second spot gets copied into B. So whatever you number the user typed in, let's say I typed in, Say, let's say I typed in a five and a two. When this method runs, because of this line, there's going to be a five here and a two here, which means when I do the calculation, it's going to be five times five plus two times two. That result then gets returned back to get caught by the equals. So result, this variable result, will contain the five times five, so 25 plus four. So that'll contain 29. So this result contains 29, and the, then it gets printed out. So we have a print statement there at the end. So the flow of the program is then we take input one and input two, copy them into A and B because of their, their order here in, in the list and the order of A and B in the list. They're, they're plugged into the method. You can, you can think of this in sort of a math terms, like sort of a plug and chug type thing. You have some values, you have an equation. In this case, it would be a method. You plug those values in. So sort of the, uh, you, if, if, if you hear me say, oh, yeah, plug those values into the method and, and get the return value. That's what I mean. We're taking the values from the method call and we're putting them into, in this case, A and B. Then the return value, whatever number comes back, will get stored into result. And then, of course, after that, it'll print out the value. So the flow here is actually just run all these initial lines, then do the calculation. Once the calculation is done, then continue on. So we sort of stop the main program at that point. We go into the method, run the method, and then come back out of the method. That's the flow. And again, anything I put in here, in these two arguments, the values that actually go into the method call, they're, go they're going to be copied. And I have to have the exact number of of arguments that I have parameters. So I need two values when I call do calculation in order for this to work because I need an A and a B to actually run the calculation in my code. That's the main flow. So does anyone have any questions about the flow of the program at this point? We're going to do some more examples, but does anyone have any questions about this flow? All right, so the benefit to methods, the reason why you would want to write a method is that every time you call the method, you can pass in different values. That's the power. So if you have some large complicated calculation you need to do, and potentially in your code, you need to do it say multiple times, then you can just write a method that does the complicated calculation and then just call that method whenever you need it. It's, a, it's the same idea as using math.squirt or math.pow. It's exactly the same thing. Those are, just, those are just methods. 
rather than writing all of the code to do a square root every single time you need to do it, you just call a method to do it. So it's going to reduce the amount of code you have to write, which most of the time means you'll make, you'll make less errors. The less code you write, the less issues are going to crop up in, in, in your code. So this is that same example, except for this time I'm calling do calculation twice. So I send in a three and a four. I print that result out. And then I send in a two and an eight. So rather than writing a times a plus b times b both times with different values for result one and result two, I just call the function and send in different arguments. That's the power of methods. And as you write more and more code, you will mostly be writing your own methods. You most likely won't put everything in main like we've been doing so far for our homeworks and, and for our labs. You'll be writing your, your own methods or I will give you empty methods and have you write the, the, the methods for the homeworks. But you'll mostly be writing your own methods and it becomes even more important once we get sort of further along in the semester, we'll be writing our own classes which are full of our own methods. So you'll be writing lots and lots of methods. So it's important to understand exactly how they work. So again, the key, the sort of two key things with calling a method are you have to send in arguments if you have parameters. If there's no parameters, you can just have open parenthesis, close parenthesis. And then we saw that uh, last time. But if you have parameters, you need to match them up. So in this case, the three would go into A, the four would go into B. And then here, the two would go into A, the eight would go into B. And if you have a return value, you need to make sure to catch it like this. So you need to have some variable equals the, cal equals the, the method call because you're going to catch that value as it comes back from the method and then use it to do whatever you need to do. So that's why you'd want to use methods. And of course, typing out do calculation, it may end up being more, more like total characters typed than just typing out a, a times a plus b times b. But of course, your methods can get very large because you might have to do some sort of important calculation and you might have a bunch of math and you might have maybe be printing something out during the course of the calculation to make sure it's right. There's all sorts of stuff that, that, that you'll be doing inside of methods. Uh, we ended last time uh, with the, the sort of Leibniz uh, uh, calculation of pi, the sort of Leibniz approximation. Uh, this is one of the ways to do this for as many terms as you want. So as many terms as you want. Remember, we did four before. We had sort of four terms, and then we added them up, and we got something that was like, I don't know, 2.6 or something like that. Not quite what we want for pi, but you can turn the method that we wrote before into something that's more generic. And actually, I, I do have this, this code written up. And I just want to just want to say a couple things about it. The, so, so I just want to say a, a, a couple of things. It does incorporate uh, a loop. So I do recommend sort of looking at this one because it does have some loop stuff that we talked about. It has a parameter. So this max here is the number that gets sent in. That tells me how many terms we want. So if I, if I want four terms, then I send in a value of four when I call the method. It also returns a double. That'll be our approximation for pi. So I need to make sure to catch that approximation, that value that I get back into pi here. So all this is going to do is print out the value of pi. And uh, if I run this, uh, right now it says you know, pi is approximately 2.6. Not quite right, but that's because we only have four terms. So if I increase this, say I go to 1,000 terms, that's a lot. That's not something you, you, you'd want to code in. So using a loop here, uh, probably a good idea. But using a method is also powerful because then I don't have to rewrite this code. I don't have to change any of the code in here. It's just the input. So I run this now. Now I get 3.139. Not quite. We could probably go even more. So I don't know. Let's try 100,000 terms. That's quite a bit. Should, should do pretty well. So here's our 3.14157. So getting there, we got, a, we got you know, four decimal places-ish of, of accuracy here. So uh, the, the point of this example isn't that the Leibniz uh, calculation is, isn't great. The point of the example here is 
we have a method that we could now potentially use any time we need we need pi. And we just say how many terms we want to use. How many of those, you know, four over one minus four over three plus four over five and so on. How many of those terms do we want? We don't have to change anything in here. It's all general. We just send in what the max is, so how many terms we want into our function, into our method, and then get the value back. So again, that's, that's the power of methods. And this is sort of the thing that we left off with last time. We did four terms. This is generalized now to be as many terms as we want. Right. Okay. This next this next slide here and and sort of a a, a couple of slides uh, after are are quite important. And we're going to see what effect this has today and uh in in sort of the, the next lecture and maybe lecture after that. It's one of these concepts that you normally don't think about too often when you're programming, but it can have major implications on how you decide to approach a problem. So arguments by default in Java are passed by value. This means that, like I mentioned with, with the code that we just saw, the values are copied. So we, we had the do calculation just a moment ago, and we sent in, a, say, a 4 and an 8. Those values were copied from the main method into the method that we wrote. So the 4 was copied into A, the 8 was copied into B, and there's literally a copy made. So in your memory on your computer, there is a separate memory location for A and B as opposed to, say, input one and input two is a separate place in memory that's in main, that, that, that affects main. If I change the value of A or B in my method, it does not affect the value of the inputs into my method. I'm going to show you an example of this. Whenever you hear pass by value, Think of it as a copy. There's a whole separate copy not related to the actual inputs themselves. There's a copy that's made, and then you can do whatever you want with the values in the method. It does not affect anything outside of the method. The opposite of pass by value is pass by reference. Some languages are only pass by reference. Some languages are only pass by value. Some languages combine the two. It is important to know which is which in different contexts. So Java has passed by reference for some things and passed by value for other things. For your regular variables, ints, doubles, uh, booleans, you know, whatever sort of regular sort of uh, uh, primitive variable types, so like so numbers and, and letters and stuff like that, those are passed by value by default. One of the things that we're going to start talking about next time uh, arrays, they are passed by reference. So we're going to talk about the differences between the two, especially when we get to arrays. For now, whenever you send in a number or a single character letter into a method, know that a copy is actually made. I do have this one already coded up because I want to be able to show you sort of all the individual pieces here, but I want to point out a few things on the slide first. So I've got x and y, 10 and 20. And then I have this, this value result. I also have a method. So we have a method down here. It's worth examining the method first. Say, all right, we're returning a double. So that's why when I actually do the, when I actually call the method, it saves the value of the result into my result variable. The name is do calc, and it takes two values. So it'll be A and B. Now, remember the flow from, from, uh, from the previous slide, or from, well, from the previous slides. The value X, whatever value is in X, is going to be copied into A. And whatever is in Y gets copied into B. And, and it is a literal copy. This is what I mean by pass by value. So the 10 that's in X gets copied into A. 
and the 20 that's in Y gets copied into B when I call the method on this line. Now I have all these prints in here, and that's because I want to show you that even if we mess around with A or B in the method, it has no effect on X or Y. So here we say, okay, so for the method itself, it says at start of do calc, A, which is a copy of X, which is 10, should be whatever value it is. So we're, we're going to print that out. Then I change A. I reduce A by 5. So I do A equals A minus 5. So if A was 10, then A would now be 5. So it would be 10 minus 5 gives us 5. And so I should see here that this one prints out 5. Then I return A squared plus B squared. I print out X back in main, and then I print out the result. This X will still be 10. It's not going to be 5. Even though I changed A in the method, it has no effect on X, even though, X, even though A was a copy of X. So I have this one coded. Let me get a bunch of output here. So let's take a look. So the very first print should be before do calc, x equals 10. That, that, that should make sense. x is 10. We print out 10. All right, we're good to go. Now we run do calc. All the copying takes place. x gets copied into a, y gets copied into b. So the next print will be at start of do calc, because we're in the method now. We just called the method here. At start of do calc, a equals 10 because of that copy, because of, of, of that copying uh, that happens. I reduce A by 5. Now I print out at end of do calc, A equals 5. So that should make sense as well. We took these inputs. We made a change to one of the inputs. We printed out. That changed. We can see it. But after we finish the method, so we're now we're on line 8, we print out x again. What is x? It's 10. x never changed. The copy of x changed, but that was a totally different thing. x never got changed. And then here, the result of the calculation, so doing a squared plus b squared was uh, 425. So that's the idea of pass by value. If I make a change to a value in a method, it does not change the value that was sort of outside, wherever you called that method. It only changes the copy. Again, pass by reference, which is what we'll be, we'll be coming to in the near future, is completely different. It's opposite. If you make a change inside of a method, it does change the thing outside of the method. So that's something that we will uh, be talking about in the near future. But for regular values, ints, doubles, chars, booleans, those are pass by value. And uh, the reason I'm, why, why, I'm, why I'm harping on this a lot is because it is an important concept. Because understanding the pass by value versus pass by reference and when they are happening can have a major effect on your code. Because if you expect it to work one way and it's not working that way, then you may have to rewrite your code to fix that problem. Okay, so is there any questions on the pass by, pass by value piece here? Uh, I have a quick slide on uh, getting input in a method. Oftentimes, you will see user input rather than straight in main will be sort of uh, uh, sent out to a method. So potentially, if you need to get lots of user input or something, you can just have a method call that actually gets that and not either not fill your main up with a bunch of code or call the method multiple times to get multiple types of input. The best idea here, and sort of the the, the, the standard uh, the standard form for this, is to uh, pass the scanner into the method. So have the scanner be one of the inputs. So notice that this is not a double, not an int, not a boolean. It's it is actually scanner. So whatever scanner I create in main, I could just pass that variable in, and it's called s. 
in the function. So I can then say s dot next int. In that case, you can just sort of thinking of think of it as in this function, it's it's going to be called in this method, it's going to be called s. In main, it was called input. So that's that that that's sort of the process here. We're not going to have to worry about this too much in the near future, but I did want to mention that sort of standard practice or best practice is to not create a scanner in a method, but to just create a scanner in main and then pass it in to the method as a parameter. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in the future as well, but I just wanted to bring it up uh, uh, right now, just so if you do see something like this where a scanner is getting passed in, that's just a way that we can uh, not worry about creating a scanner within a method. Okay, we saw uh, return statements. Any method can have one or more return statements. Now you may wonder, well, what does that mean more than one return statement? How, how does that work? Potentially, if you want the method to return something different, depending on the situation, you may have a return statement for one situation and a different return statement for a different situation. As soon as the method hits a return statement, then the method's done. It sends back to whatever called it, so main, for instance. Uh, yeah, so most of this is, is just sort of that, that sort of no more of the methods executed when in main. Uh, this is sort of this is one you can also use to exit out of a, a program. So when you're in main, if you put a return in main, the program finishes. Because main is just a method too. So if main exits, the whole program's done. So you could use a return inside of main to exit the program. That's sort of one of the other ways to do it. This is useful, the, the particularly the last thing here. This is useful uh, if, for example, you get some sort of weird input from the user. You don't have to put system.exit. That's one of the things that I, that I showed you a while back. You can literally just put return. So if you don't remember system.exit and you want to exit the program for main, you can actually just put return, and it'll do the same thing. So that's, uh, that's sort of an, another way to exit out of a program if you need to. This is an example of multiple returns. For the most part, everything here should be sort of pretty simple. We've got a scanner, we create an input value, we tell the user enter an integer, and we read the integer in. So, the, so there's nothing new here at the beginning. It's just sort of your standard stuff to read something in. I have an if statement here, and the point of this program is to tell you, is that input value, so is this, even or odd? So I have a method that returns a Boolean. Remember, Booleans are true or false. And it takes in a number, an integer number in this case. And its name is is even. So it takes in a number. And it says if the number mod 2 is equal to 0. So if you divide the number by 2 and there's no remainder, then is this even? Yes, I return true. Otherwise, I return false. So there's a situation where you have two return values. Only one of them is ever going to get activated, depending on the number you put in. Only one of them is ever going to get run. But we have two in the same method. And it's sort of it's the either or. If you're divisible by two with no remainder, return true. Otherwise, return false. So hopefully this method makes sense. We have to return a Boolean. So we return true or false. We send in a number. But one of the things that you might think you might uh, uh, be a little bit confused with is this. There needs to be a Boolean expression inside of my if parentheses. So we would always put something like if uh, x equals 3 or if x is greater than 5. We would put in something like that. That gives us a Boolean, a true or a false. But in this case, I'm actually calling the method within the if condition. So you may wonder, uh, is, is, that, is that OK to do? Yes. The reason is because is even gives us back a true or a false. And the parentheses after the if need a true or a false statement. So because is even returns a Boolean, it's perfectly fine to put it inside of parentheses for the if statement. 
because is even is a boolean. It's a boolean because that's what it returns. So when Java runs this piece of code, it's going to run is even first, get the true or false value, and then run the if. So if it's true, then we'll print out the number is even. Otherwise, we'll print out the number is odd. So hopefully the method sort of makes sense based on the stuff we've been talking about. The only, again, the only thing you might get hung up on a little bit is this guy here with the calling the method inside of the condition for an if. So is there any questions on this one? Uh, and I have a couple of pop-ups here, multiple return statements and returns a Boolean that can be used directly in an if statement. So a couple of pop-ups based on what I'm talk, talking about. All right, so I'm going to show you how I go about uh, sort of thinking about writing a method uh, when I'm given sort of a problem like this. Uh, in, in the near future for your homeworks, you'll be sort of adding two methods, uh, like, like adding, like I'll give you the, the signature for a method and you'll, and you'll be adding to it, making sure that it works pro properly. Uh, so that'll be coming up in some of the future homeworks. Uh, but I want to show you if I don't have sort of any method at all, if I don't have anything that, uh, that just sort of a blank file to start with, how do I go about thinking about uh, writing the method? Do I do I do this this the same sort of thing with with uh, that I do with like if statements and and for loops like outline stuff first and then think about it so uh, so we're going to go through that so for this case this is we're going to write a program it calculates the area of a rectangle given the two side lengths those are going to be provided by the user so so that should immediately tell you we need a scanner we need a couple of variables we need to have the user enter the the length and width for example and we're going to write a method that is passed those two side lengths and returns the area. Now, I'm not gonna worry about like negative values and, and zero and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna make this as simple as possible. But in principle, you'd probably wanna check to make sure that there's no negative values, for instance. So uh, similar to what a bunch of your homeworks have, like you have to check to make sure that it, it makes sense, that, 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 that the calculation actually makes sense uh, when you're working on it. All right, so I have uh, main here. Nothing else in here. There's no uh, there's no scanner. There's no imports. There's no nothing. So because I need to read some input from the user, I'm just going to start with the scanner, and I'm going to call it inputs, and this will be new scanner. System dot in. Now, of course, I don't have the import that I need for scanner, so I can either type import Java util scanner uh, at the top above the class. Or I can just hover over the scanner, uh, the scanner sort of error that, that pops up, and I can. The, usually, the first one will be import scanner Java util, and so that automatically puts it in for me. Uh, we can create some of the variables right now if you want to. Uh, I'm going to create uh, the area, so I'm just going to have it be a double. I'm going to assume the user can type you know whatever they want to into the, into this. So I'm going to create the, the the area variable. We could create the length and the width variable, but I'll save those for when we actually read the value in. So I want to print, and I'm going to say, uh, enter the side length uh, like this. I'm not printing out any extra variables, so I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to say double, so I'm going to create another variable. I'm just going to call it L, and this will be a uh, input dot next, next double. So we're going to read the value in from the keyboard, save it into L, and then I'll do one more of these prints. So I'm going to take the two lines, eight and nine, that I just wrote, and I'm going to put them in here, and I'm going to say enter the side width. I should probably just say enter your length and width or something, but that's fine. And I'll change the uh, L to a W here. So we're getting L and W. I already have the, the variable area declared, so I can use that when I do the calculation. Uh, and, and, then, and then we'll print out the results at the end. Now, I'm going to do this without a method first. So I've, if I did something like this, I'd say area equals L times W. Easy. And then I can print that out. So if you were doing a homework or you were doing a lab or something, and I didn't say anything about using methods, this sort of thing here would, 
would work fine. So I'd say the area is, and I'll do a percent point two F and a new line, and I'll print out area. So I run this and I enter in two and four, I get the area is eight. Okay. Makes sense. This this works. Again, I'm going to keep it uh, compact, so I'm not going to put in a whole bunch of stuff to, to print out an error message if you enter something negative, but sort of in principle on a homework or something, that is what, what you would do. But the stipulation of my slide, of my question said, use a method where I pass in the two side lengths and return the area. So essentially, I'm replacing this line with a call to a function. So I'm going to write my own method. Again, it has to be outside of main. So main is between this bracket and this bracket. So it's got to be outside of this, but still within my class. So it, has, so it does still have to be between the bracket for the classes. So right out here should work fine. For now, we put public static in front of, in front of everything else in our method. This needs to return the area. Well, what is the area going to be? It's going to be a double. So I'm going to have a public static double. I can give this method whatever name I want. So I can say something like calc area, whatever, whatever, name, whatever name feels good. And then I need to be able to send it L and W, so the length and the width. Both of those values are also doubles. So I would say double length, comma, double width. So that first line that I just wrote, and this is the line that you'll sort of always start with, is the signature. What does this method do? What does it take? What does it return? And what is it called? Then I can just say return length times width. Those are two doubles multiplied together, which is a double. So I'm returning a double, which is why Eclipse has sort of highlighted these lines to make it known that, yes, I'm doing this correctly. And then up here on line 12 in my code, then I can say calc area L W. If I run it again and I put in two and four, I still get the value eight. Now you might think, all right, well, it was like, it was literally three characters to do the calculation on line 12 here without the method. Here I had to type all this other stuff and then I had to, to actually do the method call. Uh, what am I gaining from this? Well, you would be right in that you would write a lot less characters if you, uh, if you just sort of did L times W. But this gives us the flexibility to call this method and compute the area of any rectangle we need in the rest of the code. Now, we're not, I'm not going to write any extra code to, to compute areas of lots of rectangles, but it gives us that flexibility. And later on, for example, if I, if I write a completely new code and I need to compute the areas of some rectangles, I can literally just copy this code out and put it in my new code, and I'm good to go. I have the function or the method ready to go. It's this idea of sort of separating out your code putting, writing codes in little small chunks, writing pieces of code in small chunks, kind of like calc, calc area, so that it's reusable. It's one of the features of, of programming that we're going to get more and more into is this reusability. For loops are the same way. It lets you reuse some code that you wrote to do the operation over and over again. Methods are the same type of thing. Methods lets you reuse code that you've already written over and over again with different inputs. When we get into uh, when we get into uh, uh, programming classes like object oriented stuff uh, uh, in in the sort of future or sort of probably after after the, the after the second exam, you'll see the same sort of thing. It lets us reuse a lot of our code so that we don't have to write nearly as much. So that's that's the power here. It's this reusability idea, so that you as a programmer can do less work in the long run. Even though in this case, writing the the method and calling the methods a little bit more work up front it will ultimately let you do more work or do less work in the long run, uh, which, which can be very important for large projects. All right, so for this, uh, this, this little rectangle uh, example, does anyone have any questions?
Okay, so the uh, sort of a possible sort of result here is, is, is there on the next slide. Uh, methods are going to be very important for the future. You're going to be using methods throughout all of the sort of programming stuff that, that you ever do. So uh, the take home from this is that methods are essentially mini programs. Understanding the syntax of them, the sort of the signature of them is important, but in most languages, they're, they're sort of similar ideas. You have inputs that you send in and outputs that you get back out and the method has a name. So no matter what language you've used, if you've programmed in the past or not, you will sort of come across similar ideas. It's just the syntax might be different depending on the language. Uh, methods can have zero or one return value. If it doesn't have any return value, if you don't intend to return anything from a method, you just put void instead of double or int or something else. If it does have a return value, you have to say what the type is. So my public static double calc area, that double is that type that it's returning. Uh, it can have zero or more parameters. You can have as many parameters as you want. If you have zero parameters, then you just don't put anything after you don't put anything inside of the, the parentheses after the method name. If you have parameters, you comma separate them. Every parameter has to have a type. And then when you call the method from you know, main or something, you have to make sure that those arguments, the values you want to copy in, are the correct uh, types. And then methods can have sort of as many return statements as you want. Uh, to, to do sort of any sort of particular calculation you want to do. So for our sort of is, is even method that you saw earlier, one return statement was true if you were even, otherwise it was false. So you can have multiple return statements in that context. So that's, that's the take home on methods. You'll probably need some practice on it if you haven't sort of used methods or sort of seen methods uh, uh, at all before, but we will be using them throughout most of the rest of the semester, especially on uh, some of the upcoming homework. Something that goes along with these concepts is scope. All variables have a set scope. This is the part of the code where the variable can be used. So there's this, the, the concept of local scope and global scope. Those are sort of the ubiquitous concepts. Some languages have sort of different sort of variations of this, but for the most part, there's a local scope and there's a, a global scope. So if you declare a variable within a method, that variable is local only to that method. Remember, main is a method too. So if I declare a variable in main, I can only use it in main. If I declare a variable in another function or another method that I write, it can only be used in that method, not anywhere else. Method parameters, so we saw like double A, double B in our like do calc or, or, or the length and the width in our, in our calculate the area. Method parameter variables are local variables for that method. We're gonna, we will see some examples of this. But whenever you see a variable being created, so whenever you declare a variable, it has a scope. Determining what that scope is can be important if you want to try to use it somewhere else in your program. Uh, again, the specifics of scope, they might vary between languages, but this idea of local and sort of global scope are, are sort of for the most part in, in, uh, in most languages. So here's just a, just a, dumb, a dumb little example. Uh, we're not going to code this one up. I'm just going to point out all the variables and I'm gonna point out what their scope is. So every time I create a variable, so in this case, scanner input, int input value, int result, those are all variables that I've created. They all have a scope. So input is local to main. I can't use input anywhere else except for, get my uh, annotate back. I can't use input anywhere else except between the open and close bracket for main. Those are the only places that I can use input. Same thing with input value. I have an extra underscore here. But same thing for input value. It's local only to main. And result, it's local only to main as well. So because those variables are created within main between the main's brackets, they can only be used within main. Uh, 
My function down here, my method factorial, has a, a variable n, which is local only to this method. So if I tried to use n back up here in main, Java's not going to know what n is. Same thing with total. Total is local only to main. This is why we have parameters and return values for methods so that we can send that information around because normally I wouldn't be able to use it. I can't just put input value in here for n. I have to send it into the method using its parameter. So this input value gets copied into n, and then I can use n in here. I can't directly use input value. So this idea of scope is partially the reason why we have to use parameters and return values in methods, because everything has a, a set scope of where it can be used when you create it. It's determined when you create the value itself. Different scopes mean different variables. So if you have a variable in, uh, in, in, in a method and in main, they can have the same name. There's nothing stopping you from using the same names in, in, different, in, in different places. They can be different types. You could have a variable called result that's a, st a string in one method and a variable called result that's a double in another method. But because they would have different scopes, they are different variables. Java treats them totally separate. They're not related at all. So one of the things I'd recommend uh, as, as, you, as you sort of get used to this sort of scope idea, especially as you're writing methods and then in, in the future writing classes, uh, just try not to reuse variable names. There are certain ones that sort of get, get reused uh, uh, for, for sort of historical reasons, but uh, try not to reuse variable names in different methods or sort of different scopes because it can be confusing when you go back and look at your code later. You see a variable called result and you might go, oh, okay, that makes sense, but then it's because you've named it something that the same as something else and you can, you know, it's easy to get confused. A common practice though is for uh, like counter variables, like when you write a for loop, for example, is to use variable names like i and to just reuse them throughout. So if you see i in a bunch of places, it's probably a counter variable related to a loop in some way. And then those are sort of commonly reused, like i, j, k, x, y, z, stuff like that, uh, are sort of commonly reused throughout. Uh, but just to avoid confusion, try not to reuse more specific variable names uh, in multiple places. So for example, some, something like this. Uh, I have this variable called my num, and in main, it's 10.5. And then in, in my method here, I have a variable called my num as well, and its value is, I've set its value to something totally different. Now, these, value, these, these my nums are totally unrelated. They don't, they, they're not related at all. They're not the same, they're not the same uh, variable. But it could be easy to get confused. You might see main and be like, all right, so my num was 10.5. And then later on, you have some big method and you see my num again. You might make the assumption, oh, it's the same one as main. And maybe it just got passed in or something. But it's not. So that is something to try to, to keep in mind. Try not to reuse variable names or reuse them uh, sort of as, as little as possible. Uh, back in the olden days, uh, when computers had very little memory, uh, it was actually common, if, if you could, to sort of reuse variables in different contexts because you had limited amount of memory. Uh, that's not a problem these days. So uh, if you do write homework problems, if, you, if you're working on your homework and you do end up using gigabytes and gigabytes of memory, then you've probably done something wrong. So, uh, so you got plenty of memory to, to create as many variables uh, as, as you want to and use the same names and reuse them for different things and, and all of that. There is a scope that encompasses all of your methods. So this would be kind of a global sort of scope in, in other languages. Uh, in, in Java, we can call that a class scope. So you can put variables in class scope by declaring them outside of all the methods, but inside the brackets for the class. So we're going to look at a couple of examples of this. And we're going to talk a lot more about it later because once we get into OOP programming we're going to have lots of class scope variables but for now uh, if you want to create cat class scope variables and I'll, sh I'll show you sort of some versions of that uh, it's useful for constants 
stuff that's not going to change, but that uh, is something you might need to use in multiple places. Variables and constants, you cannot place them outside of the class. So nothing goes outside of the class except, except for your import statements. Other languages can be more or less restrictive of these sort of global type variables. So in, in a lot of the, the sort of nuclear physics stuff that I did, uh, some of the older programmers would use uh, these things called uh, uh, common blocks in uh, Fortran. They were effectively global variables. You could use them anywhere in your program. You'd have some gigantic 20,000 line program. You create a common block, you can use it anywhere. So that's a very sort of uh, uh, not very restrictive use of global variables. It was a pain to deal with in some cases, but that's sort of a, an overall sort of global variable. Java doesn't have something exactly like that. The class scope is sort of as, as close as it gets. So depending on the language you use in the future, it's worth looking at all right, what type of scopes can variables have. Is there a global scope? Is there a class scope? Is there a method scope? That, that sort of thing. As far as constants go, if you have a variable that won't change or has a special meaning, it can be a constant in your code. So uh, for the, for the, again, for the nuclear physics stuff that, that I did, like speed of light, that was always constant. That was just a constant variable that we could use anywhere in our program because it was in one of these sort of global blocks. Uh, massive proton, massive neutron, that, that sort of stuff, some, some, some other constants, h-bar uh, uh, and stuff like that. They were, all, they were all constants for our code. The convention for constants is to have the variable name in all capital letters. You don't have to do that. It's not, it's not some requirement. But it means that when you look at somebody's code and you see a variable that's in all caps, the first thing you should think is, that's a constant. So I don't have to worry about it changing somewhere else. Java does include a keyword that makes it so you cannot change it. You cannot change the value after it's been set the, the first time. So that's, that, that keyword is final. We're going to keep using this uh, static keyword. Uh, it's something that I'll, that I'll show you in just a second. If I say final int cents per dollar, 100. Cents per dollar can never be changed after this, after this line. It will always be a value of 100. And it makes sense to do this for, for a constant. If it's never going to be different, then throw it in there. We will talk more about the meaning of static later on. But if you create a variable in class scope, you'll want to make it static. So an example is something like this. Here is my class scope variable. So it's not in a method. So we've got main starts and ends here. We've got dollars to euros starts and end here, and euros to dollars starts and ends here. Dollars per euro is static. So if, because, because we're in the class scope, so class scope would be anything in here between the brackets uh, for the class. We put static in, and then we say final, so it's a constant, cannot change after we set the value. It's a double all caps, dollars per euro, and then whatever that value happens to be. So notice what we can do, and this, this is the power here. I can use dollars per euro in all the methods in my class because its scope is now the, everything inside of the class. So it's essentially my, my, my conversion value. So in this case, main is just calling uh, dollars to euro and euros to dollar with a value, and I'm using that constant in multiple methods. So anything in an outer scope, so the class scope is an outer scope to the method scopes. Methods have scopes only between their brackets. Anything in an outer scope can be used in an inner scope. It can take a little bit of practice to get intuition on sort of how scope works in all of these different contexts. But keep in mind, when you are creating a variable, it implicitly gets a scope. Anything, any scope that's sort of beneath 
or inside of the scope you recreate the variable, you can use it. Anything outside, you can't. So for example, dollars here and euros here are created in the methods. So I cannot use them outside of their scope where they're created. This doesn't only apply to methods. And so, so that, that'll, be, that'll be sort of uh, the sort of scope gotchas and then a couple other uh, uh, rules in, in the next few slides. If you have a class scope variable and a local variable in a method that have the same name, the local variable hides the class scope variable. So we'll look at that in a second. The class scope variable won't be accessible within the same scope as a local variable with the same name. So this goes back to some of that sort of naming stuff. So let's, let's look at this. We've got a class scope variable here. So we're in the scope of our class. So my var equals 10. But notice, in main, I also have a my var within main's scope. So my var here, my var here. Which one do you use? That's what the gotchas on the previous slide were. You always use the variable that is closest to the scope that you're in. So the my var here hides the one up here. So this print would print out 42. It would not print out 10. Even though it's the same name, if it's in an outer scope, the one in the inner scope will hide. Whereas in my method, so the method down here, this my var is this one. So this would print 10. This would print 42, even though it's the same name. So that's what I mean by hiding. 42 variable here would hide the 10 version. So you can avoid this completely just by not reusing variable names. So that's something to, uh, to remember as you're creating variable names. If you just don't reuse very variable names for, for stuff, particularly in different scopes, you, just, you never have to worry about this. But it is something that could potentially come up and could be confusing. If I'm looking at main and I'm going, and, uh, or if I'm looking at some method and I'm going, well, main has this 42, why is this one printing out 10? That's a scope problem. And scope problems can be tough to diagnose. You may have to use, uh, you may have to use a debugger to figure out, all right, why do I have these weird values being printed? Well, it's because I have multiple variables of the same name in different scopes, and some of them are overriding other ones. So uh, another reason not to use the same name in, in different contexts like this. And then I have a couple of pop-ups here that, that sort of show this. Okay, so a few other scope rules. Any variable declared within a code block is local to that block. This is important. This is the one that might trip you up. The method one, the method one and sort of the class scope and method scope variables are relatively straightforward. You just know that if you create a variable within a method, it's, you can only use it in that method. So that one's sort of not, not too hard to remember. Sort of all the, the, the sort of little, little examples and the slides before this are basically saying that. You create a variable in a method, you can't use it outside the method. But there are a few other rules that are very important. A code block is any code between brackets. Any variable you create within a code block is local to that block only. Well, when do we use brackets in our code? After methods, after classes. Okay? That, that's why we've been talking about class scope and method scope and stuff. But we also use brackets for if else, for while loops, for for loops, in the future for other things as well. That means if I create a variable within a for loop, it can only be used within that for loop. Even if we're all in the same method, if I create the variable in the for loop, 
It can only be used within the for loop, not outside. So brackets are the key to scope in Java. If you create it in a set of brackets, it cannot be used outside that set of brackets. That's why in the previous examples, when I was sort of circling stuff and sort of mentioning this, the, the sort of scope of things, I was circling the brackets because those are the key to scope. The same rules that we just talked about for hiding, they apply to every level of scope. So, so again, one more time, just try not to reuse variable names. Don't use the same name in, in different scopes, and you don't have to worry about the whole hiding thing. I'm going to code up a, a couple of things that are going to be related to this. And uh, it's just, in this case, it's just it's a, a simple for loop. But I'm going to point out a few places where scope might cause an issue. So I'm going to get rid of the method here and everything I got here. Okay. And we rest. All right. So I'm going to create a variable i. This is in main scope. So this is in method scope. It's between these two brackets, these two uh, curly brackets here. So I can use it anywhere within main. I'm going to write a for loop, say i equals zero. I less than, I think in the slide I had like 10 or something. I plus plus. So I've got a loop and I got another set of brackets. So if I create a variable in here, int j, j is only usable within the brackets for the for loop. And I can say something like j equals, I don't know, I plus one or something, you know, whatever, just set it to a value and then print it out. I'm going to say J and a percent D and a percent N. And then after everything is done, so after the for loop is finished, after the for loop brackets, we'll print out one more time. And this will be printing out uh, I. So we're going to see what the value I is uh, after we're done with this. So if I run. J goes from 1 to 10. So hopefully that makes sense for the printing in here. And then I is 10 at the end. We did I less than 10 for our condition. So when I gets to 9, that's the last time through. And then when I goes to 10, this is now false. And that's why we print out 10 at the end. If I wanted to print out J, I would not be able to do that. If I replace I with J here, Eclipse is going to tell us J cannot be resolved to a variable. So on the screen, if you can't see the, the tiny text here, that's what it says. J cannot be resolved to a variable. It doesn't know what J is. Even though J is here, it only exists, according to, to Java, between the two brackets for the for loop. I works anywhere in between these brackets for main. So that means that includes inside of the for loop. That's why I can use I in the for loop because it's between these brackets. So that's this idea of the sort of outer loop, uh, outer scopes and inner scopes. So I works outside, J does not. J only works inside. And then I also works inside the for loop. Okay, we're going to do, we're, we're going to look at one more sort of version of this. Uh, does anyone have questions on this one? So we'll look at one more version. I'm going to rewrite this uh, for loop. I'm going to have a couple of prints in here as well. It's, it's not going to be, it's not even going to be quite as much code as what we just wrote. If I do a for loop like this, and this is a very common way that you're going to see for loops. So I'm going to start with int i equals zero. So I'm creating the variable i right here. And that, again, that's very common. I, I, I do this all the time. You don't have to create i outside of the for loop if, if you don't need it outside the for loop. I'll do the same thing, i less than 10, uh, i plus plus. And in this case, I'm just going to do a, a print. So we're going to print out, uh, we're gonna say i, we're going to print that out. So percent d, percent n, and we're going to print out i. So if I run, I should see the 0 to 9. Now, if I take the same print statement and I put it outside, of the for loop, 
that says I cannot be resolved to a variable. So even though technically I didn't create I between the brackets of the for loop, if I create a variable in the parentheses for the for loop, it is considered to be inside of the for loop. So I, in this case, is in the for loop scope. It only exists in the for loop. That's why I can print it out here, but not here. So if I want to know the value of my, in this case, I, after the for loop, this will never work. I will never be able to get the value of I directly if I declare it like this. I have to put I like this. I have to do this. to get my value of i printed at the end. Same thing goes for stuff like uh, if statements. If you create an if statement and like an else statement or something, these are brackets. I'm going to say if true, I guess that, that would give me a warning here for this. So let's say if i if i equals 10, if I create another variable in here and j equals 3, or j equals 4, I cannot use j outside of the brackets here. So if I want to print out j, it will not work. Does not know what j is. So whenever you see curly brackets, that's going to give you an information about the scope. If I create a variable inside of some curly brackets, it only exists inside of that of those curly brackets. So this is for this works for for loops, this works for if statements. In fact, it's not just that. It works for just brackets. I can put brackets in here. If I comment these brackets out, then of course I can print out J. But if I have these brackets in, this is its own scope. even though there's nothing sort of different about the code than having these brackets and not having them in this case, this does create its own scope. So there actually is a difference when you use curly brackets. So if you ever see like a block of code for that, has, that doesn't look like it's doing anything, it's potentially just making it its own separate scope. You shouldn't be doing this too often. This isn't something that you need to do. Uh, the, 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 this isn't something you'll find that, that you need to do very often. Uh, probably not at all. But it does still follow that sort of sc scope rule. All right, so as far as scope goes, does anyone have any questions? All right, I have a couple pop-ups here that uh, mention what, what we just talked about and that other example with a few pop-ups. All right, so all variables and constants, they all have a certain scope. So class scope, method scope, block scope. So for the if and the, and the else and the, the for loop and that's just curly brackets by themselves, that would be sort of a block scope. Uh, variables can only be used within the same scope or subscopes. So any scope sort of inside of the scope you're already in. Be careful about reusing variable names. There's hidings and stuff that goes on. Uh, class constants are useful. So if you want to take a look and potentially use some of the constant stuff in some of the homeworks in the near future, I will give you some constants. So for example, the, uh, the error messages that the J units want. Sometimes you have to run the code, or at least the past few homeworks, you've had to run the code first and then see what the error message is supposed to be so you can code it in. In future assignments, I will be giving you a class scoped constant that you can just use that is the correct error message. So you won't have to do some do trial and error to figure out what's the error message supposed to be. Uh, and we'll use class scope variables more in the future when we get to OOP stuff, so that'll be sort of, sort of details for later on. Uh, next time is method overloading and arrays. So sort of a sort of a dual thing. Method overloading is not sort of too long, so uh, so we'll we'll finish with some arrays next time. Uh, PA three is due on Thursday, so make sure that you're working on that. And LA two uh, in lab this week, so you will be working on more lab stuff. Essentially, we'll have labs sort of every Friday for the most part for for the rest of the semester. So that that is it, guys. Uh, I will see you on uh, Thursday. 
Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Professor. You.